Good morning. My name is Mark, and uh, I'm your preacher for the morning. Uh, some of you were here last week, and it's good to see you again. Thank you for the welcome. I've already had several people express their condolences to me about the game yesterday. Uh, I happen to be, as some of you last week remember, I'm an IU grad and just came from Bloomington First United Methodist Church for nine years. And so congratulations to Purdue. A great week for the Boilers with the win over Iowa and Indiana. And for Indiana, uh, you know, it's a, it's a character building experience, right? So, but I'm glad you're here this morning. I would call your attention uh, to the announcements in the insert this morning. If you're here and you're new to First United Methodist Church, I believe this is a congregation on the cusp of a good and new chapter. So uh, we talked some about that last week. We talked about transitions, and uh, today we're going, to, and we talked about the core. Uh, when we go to the world, we go to the world. At the core of our message is Christ crucified, the love of God. That's what we've got. And today we're going to talk about wisdom and openness. So pay attention to what's happening in the life of the church. And for the moments today in worship when I don't get it right and I miss a cue, uh, I apologize. I feel a little bit like a tour guide in a city where I've only been once before. So, uh, but it is good to be here. And I would invite you this morning uh, to center yourself, to be in an attitude of openness to God as we come together and worship. And I want to thank Karen this morning for being our liturgist. Welcome.
invite you to stand if you are comfortable doing so for the call to worship, which is based on Psalm 112, verses 1 through 9. Praise the Lord, those who honor the Lord, who adore God's commandments, are truly happy. We want to be with those people, Lord. We want the joy of your spirit streaming through the days of our friends. And that kind of joy can only come from you. Praise the Lord. Those who do right will be blessed with wealth and riches. We want to be those people, Lord. Doing right not to get money, power, and people, but to do right. Praise the Lord. Those who honor the Lord shine in the dark. They are merciful and compassionate. We want to be those people, Lord. We ache to be your compassionate people, shining in the dark, lending generously, being agents of justice and right time. Praise the Lord. Those who know God and pursue righteousness are never shaken. We want to be those people, Lord. We want to be so centered in you, so grounded in your love, so confident of your faithfulness, that we won't be frightened at bad news. We want to be your people with hearts that are steady, trusting in you. Praise the Lord. I invite you to remain standing for the opening hymn of praise. One of the gifts that we can give one another when we gather for worship is to offer the peace of Christ. We live in a world where there is too little peace. And so as we begin our time together, let's, as we feel comfortable, move around the room and bless others with the peace of Christ. And you can see the appropriate responses. The bottom line, the most important thing is to greet one another in love and the peace of God. Let's do that now.
The epistle lesson this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within. So also, no one comprehends what is truly God's, except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Here ends the epistle lesson. I'd invite you into a, a time and a spirit of prayer. I think as uh, oftentimes we make this very complicated and prayer is mysterious and deep, but prayer is also a lifelong conversation with God. I don't know about what kind of week you've had. Uh, most of us come here this morning uh, having been joyed. We've had moments in life that have been good for us this week. 
and, uh, and many of us come here with particular burdens, and uh, some others know, and some we keep to ourselves. We come to this moment of prayer as a congregation in the middle of a transition on the cusp of a new thing, and that's exciting and a little unsettling. You may know of people in the church, people in your family, or people in your community who are struggling, and we want to remember them in silence as we pray. And you may also be aware of people who are in the middle of a great new beginning, either with God or a new career, new relationship, and so this is an opportunity to give thanks for them. So I invite you into a time of silence as uh, we open our hearts to God, and then I'll pray for a moment, and together we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. But I invite you to come into the presence of God in an intentional, open way. Good morning, God. We're thankful, Lord, for um, the gifts that some would say are small, the ability to sleep, hot water, something to eat, place of love and openness, not of perfection, but a place of love and openness where people bring their hungry hearts seeking you, this place. So God, we give you thanks. We, we want you to continue to teach us the art of gratitude so that whether it is hot water in the shower or a bowl of breakfast cereal or a telephone call from a friend, or the poetic way that um, snow falls from the sky. That we would live our lives with hearts of thanksgiving. And that beneath these obvious small gifts, there is the gift that you give us of yourself. You give us Jesus, and in him we can know you. We can hear you. We can see you. In him, we find life. We give you thanks for life to this day, God. We ask for your help in carrying the burdens that just break our hearts and wear us out. Hear the concerns that we bring to you this morning. Hear our fear, God. We would ask as we pray that fear would not control us, but faith would control us. We would pray this morning in a day and age when hateful words seem to be the normal way of speaking to one another, that you would control us so that we might be people who speak in love. In a day when there's turbulence between people and nations, we would ask God that you would help us to be people of peace. Speak to our hearts this day, speak to us the word we need to hear this morning. Remind us of your love that never gives up on us, God. So often we think of your love as conditional and partial, but your love for us is complete. It finds us where we are, but it never leaves us there. We give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to worship you, these moments when our lives can be recentered again in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Now hear us as your people as we pray this prayer, a model 
for our conversation with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Examining the fabric of our faith. Do they see us holding firm in our convictions? Do they see us moving forward in the cause? Do they see us with one mind and one spirit? Joy
every time I uh, read the gospel accounts of the call of the disciples, I hear Jesus calling us again, come follow me. And as Bob Dylan, uh, the great apostle, sang a long time ago, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. So uh, hear the call. The gospel reading this morning comes from Sermon on the Mount, and, um, and so I'd invite you to uh, have an open heart and mind as we come to this text. So here it is. You, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored. It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, Jesus says. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just a word of explanation about the end of that text of what it means to have our righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It means not just uh, to pay lip service to the way of God, but to do our best to live it out in love. That's what it means. So, will you pray with me this morning? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was just out of IU. I was a freshly minted a graduate with a degree in religious studies and political science. I thought I'd, I was going to go to law school, and I thought, uh, but I was intrigued with ministry. And so I said to the district superintendent, uh, could I follow a pastor around for two or three days to see what they do? I didn't know what a pastor did. Uh, I, they gave a little talk on Sunday morning, which I figured probably took about 30 minutes to put together, and then the rest of the week they were kept in a closet in the church, and then they brought them out the following Sunday. I really didn't know what they did. Maybe they went to the hospital when someone was sick. And so uh, Jerry Jones, and his son actually is here in the congregation, Jerry Jones called me back. Uh, I was 24 years old. 24, 23, and Jerry said, well, uh, the pastor at Door Village outside Laporte is going to spend eight weeks in Dallas finishing his dissertation at SMU. How would you like to pastor the church? Live in the parsonage, preach every week. That was a little more than I had anticipated, and I can tell you the day came. We moved in. Sharon and I brought our things from Bloomington. We moved into this big farmhouse. Um, we were just kids, and I can remember standing in the shower the first Sunday I was to preach, and honestly, I, I, I debated whether or not to ever step out of the shower. And then I got dressed, and I, drove, I walked across uh, a hun about a hundred-yard wide uh, fallow field to the church, and I felt for, I've got to tell you, I, I felt like one of General Pickett's men walking up the hill towards the Union lines. I just was terrified. I was terrified. I was shaking. I thought of that this week when we read in Corinthians, Paul says, I came to you in weakness, and he says, I came to you in fear and trembling. That's what he says. And I wonder, why, why was he shaking? 
And maybe one of the reasons Paul shakes when he walks, uh, when he comes to the people of Corinth is he is wondering if they know his history because Paul was, you remember, in the beginning, he was a fundamentalist um, Jew who was violent. He had issues of anger control. Maybe the people in the church, you know, have heard. Maybe he's worried that they're going to hear about his past and discount what he has to say. Or maybe he's shaking because... You know, he's a guy just, he's a guy who struggled to pass high school chemistry and he finds himself preaching in West Lafayette, just hypothetically. <laughs> or maybe the reason Paul is shaking is because he knows that the message he brings to people is so incredibly important that this, their lives hinge on getting this. That there is a God and that this God loves creation and loves us in a way that is almost, as he says in Ephesians, beyond knowledge. But he knows if they miss this, their lives will be difficult. And if they get it, their lives will be better. There's an urgency as Paul brings the message I remember one night, our family had been in Chicago all day. Our children were young. We were driving um, a little minivan, and I've driven out of Chicago scores of times, and I like to take Stony Island. It just kind of comes over from South Lake Shore Drive, connects with the Chicago Skyway that particular night. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't paying attention, and all of a sudden I realized I was where I shouldn't be. And um, I finally, uh, the, the car, the kids were little, but they got quieter and quieter as they realized there was sense, a sense that I think we're lost. And so finally, I pulled over at an Osco Jewel, and I walk up to an elderly man who was a security guard standing at the front door of the store. And before I said a word, he said this to me, you're lost, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, here's what you're going to do. He said, you're going to go out, and you're going to go back the way you came. You're going to go two lights. I remember this. You're going to go two lights, and you're going to take a left at the light. You are going to go under an overpass, and you will drive into absolute darkness, and it will look like you're driving into a dead end. But under that, in the middle of that darkness, there's a small green sign that says Chicago Skyway with an arrow to the left. And if you'll turn left... You'll be where you need to be. And so I did exactly that. I listened very carefully because I had a lot riding on this. And came to the second light, and he was right. There was this hole under an underpass. Looked like I was driving into an alley. I took the left, went into the darkness, and there was a little green sign that said Chicago Skyway to the left. And we pulled up on it, and we were where we needed to be. So maybe Paul is shaking because he knows that there are people who are lost. There are not only people who are lost, there is a world that is lost and broken and angry, and there are people who live their lives wondering if there is a God and what in the world any God would want with someone like me. So Paul says, I came to you in fear and trembling. And then he begins to talk about wisdom. Last week, if you were here last week, I, I have two words. It's wonderful to be able to preach to you. I said last week because I get to preach out of a position of ignorance. I really don't know the dynamics in the congregation. I'm, I'm just here. Pastor Lori asked me just to come and do this for two weeks. And so last week, one of the things I said to you that I want you to remember is that what we have for the world is Christ crucified. What we have for the world is a God of love. That's the message we have for the world. Don't misplace Jesus and don't forget the love because that's what we're about. And today I want to talk with you about wisdom. Um, there's wisdom and then there is knowledge. And sometimes those two things are different. There is accumulated facts and data and knowledge, and then there is wisdom. 
And wisdom comes from God as a gift. Wisdom comes to us when we take the time to listen and to watch for the Spirit's leading. Now, there are a lot of things that are really cool about being part of a university community, right? Yes? Okay. I mean, we're, we can talk here. I told you last week, periodically, I would say to the congregation at Bloomington First Church, we're smart people, aren't we? People go, oh. And then I'd say, we're smart people, aren't we? I mean, come on. We're, you know, a notch above. And people go, yeah, yeah, well, we are. You may be more humble than the people of Bloomington, but... Okay, but what, here's what I think. I think a university community is a fantastic place to, to live, and I can tell you as a preacher that a university community is a delightful group of people to preach to. They're very quick. They connect the dots. They get the point of the story, and if you say something funny, they know how to laugh. I mean, it's really delightful. A university community is bright and innovative, and they're fun to preach to. Uh, it's sort of like uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, you know, a, a university congregation is like Ginger Rogers. They, they, she did everything that Fred Astaire did, but she did it backwards and in high heels, right? But here are some other things about being in a university community. We are very smart. And we can be very quick to make judgment about people. That's what I've discovered. Some of the quickest people to judge and pigeonhole people are very bright, very well-educated university folks. So, just in a very personal way, and this one might get back to Bloomington, right? When I walked in at Bloomington First Church and people saw this old white guy who reads Sports Illustrated and tells jokes and talks a lot about Jesus, they assumed that that meant I was a very close-minded old white man. And it took them a little while to figure out that that might not be who I am. And so in a university community, we are very smart. We are very fast to make connections. We can be very fast to judge, and we can be much better at talking and teaching other people what we know than listening. Let me push this a little farther, okay? See, you'll never ask me back. One of the things that I would say to some of my friends in Bloomington who really thought, you know, they knew much better than I about uh, how to deal with the situation in the church, I, I would say to them, you know, you may know everything in the world about the sexual habits of a tsetse fly, but you don't know how to do this. So there's, there's, there's knowledge, and, and then there's wisdom. So let's talk about wisdom for a few minutes this morning, okay? Sure. All right, thank you. It's really important that you respond. I, I told people in Bloomington when I went there, I started to ask them questions, and they were very polite. You know, they were taught to listen to a lecture. And I finally walked out into the nave, and I said, look, if you don't respond, the sermon's going to slow down. If the sermon slows down, I said, then the Baptist will beat you to the buffet. And I told them I'd been at Trinity for 19 years in Elkhart. I said, you know, there the choir would hiss at some of the jokes. I, and one day I, I, I told a joke, and somebody in the balcony shouted out, don't give up your day job. So let's talk about wisdom. The first thing Paul makes very clear in, in, in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians is this that God does not leave us alone to figure things out. God doesn't leave us alone. We're not on our own. And I find that, find that incredibly reassuring because you're looking at a guy who has a terrible time figuring out how to set an alarm clock in a hotel room. I'm one of those guys that sometimes I just unplug it. So for someone like me, it is good to know that God doesn't leave me alone. And in fact, Jesus in the Gospel of John, when he's with his disciples in the last few days on the earth before their arrest, he says to them, 
as he tells them, I'm getting ready to go away, and they're troubled by that. And he says, God is going to send you a comforter, a counselor. In fact, the word he uses uh, in the complete English Bible is this. God is going to send you a teacher of truth. So you and I and the church here at First United Methodist and really outside the church community, this is true for non-believers. This is true for Jews and, and, and Buddhists and Muslims that God doesn't leave us alone, but God gives us a spirit. And it's not just a disconnected spirit up among the stars, but it is a spirit, Jesus says, that will lead you into all truth and will speak my words to you. So the Holy Spirit is always bringing us back to Jesus. When our, fam our family has a small cottage, in fact, I'm spending some time there up at Lake Webster uh, this winter doing some writing, and um, uh, the cottage has been in our family for 80 years. One of the things we like to do at the cottage is sail, and we sail not on a big yacht, but on a little thing called a sunfish. It's a great boat. It's really, it can handle about two people. And one of the things that my dad did, I'm the oldest of seven, five surviving. One of the things my dad did is he took each one of us out on the boat when we were ready to sail, and he taught us how to do it. And he showed us how to set the tiller. He showed us how to place the centerboard. He showed us how to put the sail up. Um, and then he showed us how to sail. He showed us how to turn uh, into the wind, never with the wind. Uh, he showed us how to pull the center board and get the seaweed off. And then one of the last lessons was how to, how to tip the boat back over if you rolled it. And so one of the things, we'd go out in the middle of the lake and my dad would tip the boat over. And we'd be in the water and then our dad would show us how to stand on the center board and just hold on and let your weight pull the boat back up. My dad did not leave us alone to figure that out. So, whether you're moving to the other side of the world, whether you're stepping into a new position, whether you're trying to deal with the wreckage of a broken relationship, or whether you are a congregation getting ready to begin a new chapter with a new lead pastor, one of the things I want you to know is that God doesn't leave us alone and that God provides a spirit who, if we are quiet and attentive, will lead us into the wisdom we need. That's, a, that's the first point of the sermon, okay? Here's the second point. There is power in the phrase, I don't know. There is power in the phrase, I don't know. There is power in being a congregation, and this is a challenge for those of us who are in congregations in Chapel Hill and Durham and West Lafayette and Bloomington and Evanston and Iowa City. It's a challenge for us. It is a challenge for us as people who read a lot and know a lot to say, I don't know. And there are things you see that I miss, right? And what is really irritating about life is sometimes the thing I need to see, you see, I'm missing it, you see it, and I really don't want to hear what you have to say. Because, you know, you're an IU fan. I just can't stand that. And so there's power in the words, I don't know. One of my dearest friends in ministry and in my whole life, one of the people who has blessed me along the way is now gone. His name was Craig Fulmer. He was a, a big, tall, red-headed IU guy. He was very successful in business as a CPA, and then he began to buy companies, owned several corporations in northern Indiana. He and his wife, Connie, who's still living, were just wonderful people. He volunteered with the middle school youth for over a quarter of a century. And... Um, 
Craig and I were uh, friends for over 30 years. He was staff parish chair at Trinity for about eight years, and he would do my annual review. And I'll never forget one day he came into my office, closed the door. He always had a little portfolio with him. You know, he kind of crossed his legs. He'd go through, we'd go through what was happening in the church, and he would talk about his affection for me and respect for me and, and some of the things that needed to get done yet in the church. And then I can remember one year he said this at the end of our review. He said, you know, I would say this. You are thin-skinned and defensive. Huh. I said to Craig, well, what do I say to that? If I disagree, I'm thin-skinned and defensive. I went home and I told my wife Sharon this, and she goes, I, she says, well, you are. And so as I look back on my life, I think that sometimes I thought that to be strong was to try to have all the answers. There's power. There's power in saying, whether you're in the congregation, whether you're in the youth group, whether you're on youth council, whether you're on the church council, there will be power for you when you come together for you to say to Pastor Duane or to one another, you know, I don't know how to do that. I wasn't aware of that, or I was missing that. That's the second point of the sermon. I want you to, I think, I think one of the keys for our congregation here moving forward is our willingness to be humble and to be open to the truth that others bring to the table. Okay? Third point. Is this, is this linear enough? Sometimes I'm like a bunny rabbit. I just run all over the place, linear. Know what you know and live it out and share it. Know what you know and live it out. Some of us go through life, and I think, I think one of the most, I think, see, I think there are three great commandments. People talk about two great commandments. I think there are three. The first is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is to love your neighbor, right? And then here's the third one. As you love yourself. So know what you don't know. Understand the power as a congregation of saying to Pastor Duane or to others, you know, I, I don't know. I need help with this. Together we can find the wisdom that God wants us to have, but then at the same time, know what you know, claim it, share it, and live it out. No one else sees exactly what you see. No one else has lived what you have lived. And so it's not a good thing. It's not humility to... to fail to live out what you know. There are all kinds of stories I could tell about this, but uh, one of the stories that comes to mind is years ago, we had a, a, a part-time organist who was a United Methodist pastor. He was a young guy from Pennsylvania. He was up at Notre Dame getting a PhD in religious studies and worship with uh, uh, Dr. White. And Bob had a way, and I've never seen it done exactly how he did it. Bob had a way. He knew, he knew from either teaching or experience, he knew on a familiar hymn how to stop playing the organ at the perfect time. And so it might be a familiar hymn or carol, and the congregation would be singing with a particular kind of fondness or passion or joy, and then Bob would start a verse and then a, a measure in, he would just take his hands off the organ. And he would leave us to sing the hymn just with our voices. And no one ever told him to do that. The pastors, I mean, in fact, uh, Lori Blaine Gibson, who you're, is your district superintendent, was our director of music at that church. And none of us ever told Bob knew how to do that. Bob just knew. He knew the moment. He could hear it in our voices. And when we would begin to be aware that our voices were filling the sanctuary, it was as if someone had thrown the door of heaven open and we'd stepped inside. 
So know what you know. Know what you know. You know some things. Paul says that God has been working and the Spirit's been working. Here's the third point. Uh, know what you know, okay? And the last point is this. Wisdom comes slowly sometimes. Wisdom comes slowly sometimes. So if you're like my friends in Bloomington, you know how to move fast. You've got a lot going up here. Uh, I don't know about you, but I get really irritated when my phone takes more than, oh, four seconds to hook up with the Internet. It's a life crisis. We live in a microwave age. We live in an age where um, in traffic, you know, you can always tell the people who are texting because when the light turns green, they don't move. And... Uh, we're in a hurry, but the reality wisdom comes slowly. So we have to slow down, and we have to keep our eyes open, and we have to listen, and we have to be available. One of the memories I have as a boy growing up in northwest Alaska is sometimes as a scout taking a bucket of water out of those really clear rivers in northwest Alaska and then letting the water settle and the sediment fall to the bottom of a bucket. And this may shock you, but we would actually use that water to drink. And it's, it'd take a while for the sediment to settle. And sometimes it takes a while for the sediment to settle in us. It takes time. I've driven back and forth across uh, northern Indiana on Highway 30 numerous times, scores of times. And um, just a year ago, I mean, I thought I knew every uh, stretch of that, mi every mile of that road. And, and uh, one day as I was driving east, I was near Columbia City, and I looked over to the right, and I noticed a small lake hidden by a stand of pine trees and a small rise. And I was shocked. I almost drove off the road. I thought, I've been driving this for 50 years. Wonder when they put that lake there. That's the first thought. That tells you something about me. And then I thought, you just never saw it before. So be open. Be quiet. Be slow. Be quick to say, I don't know, because the Spirit always shows up. Amen. One of the great moments of worship is the opportunity to bring our gifts, our, our tithes, and our offerings. And I know, uh, I told our congregation for years, I said, I, I, would, I would love to be able to preach a stewardship sermon or to invite people to give their gifts to God, know that not a penny came out of it to my paycheck. And the finance committee explained to me that they could arrange that. <laughs> my father, who's 93 years old, who I'm spending a, a significant amount of time with now with some health issues, has always said he's a retired physician. He's always said that the most important time in worship for him is the moment when he places his gift in the offering plate. And now he can't hear the sermon because of deafness. But he told me the other day, I've tell, told Pastor David that I can still give my offering. So for me, this isn't about supporting a budget. For me, this is a moment when I bring my heart to God and say, here I am for you. I invite you to give your best today. <laughs>
join me as we pray. Holy God of mercy, redemption, and grace, this morning we bring our gifts and pray that you will dedicate them to your work of love and reconnection with all your children. These gifts seem small when balanced against what Christ has given us and what you continue to give us through the Holy Spirit. In our giving, may we grow in gratitude, trust, and faithfulness. In the name of Christ, who gave all for us, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stay following the service for a time of fellowship. Some of you are going to classes, but I invite you to use this precious time to connect with each other. I want you to know that I will be in prayer for you as a congregation. I think good things are ahead. And I'll pray that you keep Jesus at the center, him crucified. The gift of self-giving love is what we are about. And that you'll be able to say, I don't know, that you'll be able to be humble and open to the spirit in one another, slow to speak, quick to listen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.